In this video, we're going to introduce the topic, how do stars shine? You'll also be meeting your guest lecturer, jo Dr. John T. Horner. Welcome to topic 12, the final topic of everyday physics. In this topic, we're going to be looking at why stars shine. Now, because you're probably getting pretty sick of me by now, for this topic, you've got a special guest lecturer. You've got John T. Horner, who's an astronomer who works in the School of Physics. In a minute, I'll let John T. tell you about himself and take over. So in this topic, you're going to be seeing how the laws of physics that we've used to, in all the topics so far can be applied in many different situations. You won't be learning much new physics in this topic, but instead what you'll be seeing is how the physics that you've already seen can be applied to lots of different topics such as astronomy. So I'll let John T take over now. Um, so thank you for the introduction, Lizzie. I'm John T. Horner. I work upstairs in the main building in physics doing astronomy research. And the main part of the research that I do these days is looking for planets around other stars. I'm part of the Anglo-Australian Planet Search team who are mainly based here at the University of New South Wales. And the members of the team observe using telescopes in Australia and try and find new planets orbiting distant stars. And to date they've found over 40 of these planets. Um, historically, my research has always looked at things in our own solar system and at these planets around other stars, but I've been interested in astronomy since I was a very small child, and I've always found everything about astronomy to be really fascinating. And what we're going to do today is try and go through a few of the different facts about stars to illustrate how the things you've learned so far on this course can be applied to very different areas of physics and to other parts of science in general. One of the things that's often overlooked when you're learning on a physics course is the fact that the tools you learn in one subject can be very widely applied to other subjects and even beyond physics itself. That's not true of the science you learn, but it's also true of the experimental techniques you develop. And in fact, many of the experimental tools that people use in hospitals, in biology research, in engineering, in chemistry, originate in astronomical research when people were building detectors to look at nearby stars to try and work out how they work. And this gives a huge amount of transfer of knowledge and transfer of in information and transfer of technology. The most famous example, the one you'd be most used to, is probably the Wi-Fi signal, which you're using to potentially view this lecture on your wireless networks. That was developed by radio astronomers working in Australia. And the patents for this are currently bringing in hundreds of millions of dollars to Australian research through CSIRO, the big Australian research organisation. So that's a little bit of a motivation behind this. What I'm going to be doing, you can see uh, on the screen now a beautiful picture of what's called the star clouds of Rofuki. These are clouds of gas and dust and a collection of bright stars somewhere towards the centre of our galaxy. And by the time we've finished this little topic, you should hopefully have some understanding of why the stars are the colour they are why they're as bright as they are, how their brightness varies between one star and the next, and also how these stars formed and where they get their energy from. We'll mainly be covering topics, mainly be covering ideas that you covered earlier on in the course, and I'll try and flag these up as we come to them one by one. There will be a few new ideas in this, but it's mainly revision, albeit revision in the guise of learning something about astronomy. So by the end of the lecture, then, you should be able to understand a lot more about, for example, this wonderful photograph of the constellation Orion, which you can see on my right-hand side here. Um, and of course, my hand just vanished behind it. So, by the end of this lecture, then you should be able to understand how the brightness of a star varies depending on how massive the star is. And you should be able to look at a picture like this very quirky photograph of the constellation Orion and be able to tell something about the different stars that you can see in that picture. So the picture you have here on my right is a time-lapse photograph of Orion as Orion moved across the sky as a result of the Earth rotating on its axis. You may have noticed when you go out on a night that if you see the constellations, if you see the night sky at one time and then you go back an hour later, everything will have moved around a little bit. And what the photographer has done here 
is he's taken 35 separate photographs as Orion moved across the sky, across his field of view. In each of those photographs, he's changed the focus of the camera. So initially, and at the end of the exposures, the camera was very out of focus, which is why you have very big blurry blobs at the ends of each star. And as he got nearer to the middle of the sequence of exposures, he made the camera slightly better focused every time. So at the very center of each of the trails, you get a star-like point. And this is a very artistic technique, but it's allowed the photographer to bring out very clearly the colors of the different stars. By the end of this lecture, then, you should be able to have some idea about what the colors of these stars mean, to have some idea of which of the stars in this photograph are likely to be young stars, which of them are likely to be old stars, which of them are intrinsically very bright stars, and whether any of them are very faint stars that might just be much closer to the Earth. You'll also be able to have some idea how they move relative to one another through our home galaxy. And you should also be able to have some idea of one of the main techniques which we use when we're searching for planets around other stars. And that's the radial velocity technique, which is what we use here at UNSW to find those extrasolar planets. Special thanks to Sebastian Frick for filming Special thanks to Sebastian Frick for filming and editing this video. Also thank you to these people who provided images with the Creative Commons license that we made use of.